my wife is incredible in a lot of ways, but one thing she's really incredible at, she is a Christmas present wrapping machine. It's like her spiritual gift or something. She's incredible at it. We keep all of our Christmas present wrapping supplies in our basement, and Donna replenishes them every year, but only after Christmas when it's 50% off at Hobby Lobby. Then she replenishes everything. In our Christmas wrapping paper inventory in our basement, we have Christmas bags. Side note, my favorite way to wrap a Christmas present, drop the present in the bag, put the tissue stuff on top of it, boom, done, clean, simple, love it. Donna, not so much. We do have the Christmas bags, but we also have in our Christmas present wrapping inventory, we have wrapping paper, we have ribbon, we have bows, we have name tags, and all of them must match. That's a key. I have three jobs whenever Donna is wrapping Christmas presents. One is I carry all the Christmas presents to her designated wrapping area. Two, I have the important job of putting my finger on the ribbon to hold it tight while she ties it off. And then three, which brings me the most joy, I get to do the Christmas name tags. Only, Donna warns me, if I don't get in a hurry and I write neatly. She knows me well. I love the Christmas name tag, you know, Christmas present name tag. One of my favorite parts of Christmas, especially if it says Kenny on it. That's really makes it good. Well, I've got a little job Christmas assignment for you. Let's say that you're going to wrap up a package of everything that Christmas is about, and you're going to slap a name tag on that package about the true meaning of Christmas, and you're going to have to write a name on that name tag. Well, we all know there's only one name that goes on that name tag about what Christmas is all about, and it's the name of Jesus, because Christmas is all about Jesus. 100% about him. This is what's really amazing. There are over 250 names in the Bible for Jesus. In other words, there's really about 250 names you could put on that Christmas name tag that define and describe who Jesus really is. And what we're going to do Christmas of 2023, starting today, we're going to look at four of those 250 names that you could put on the true meaning of Christmas name tag that represents Jesus. Each of those names define him. Each of those names describe him. You see, 700 years before that first Christmas, before the angels, before the wise men, before the shepherds, this prophet named Isaiah gave a great prophecy of love and hope about a coming Savior, a coming Messiah. And Isaiah said this, his name will be called. And then Isaiah gave us names, four different names of who Jesus is and what he means. So what we're going to do in Isaiah 9, 6, we're giving these four descriptive names of Jesus that sum up what Christmas is all about. Over the next four weeks, we're going to dive into each of those names, each of those titles that Isaiah gave to Jesus, and I pray it's going to make your Christmas 2023 more meaningful, filled with more joy, with more hope than you've had any time in your life. Our Christmas series, which comes from the words of Isaiah, where he said his name will be called, our Christmas series is called His Name. If you haven't already done it, here, and again, I want to welcome our online community. We're so glad you're with us. I would ask you to open your Bibles or your Bible app to Isaiah chapter 9, and for the next four weeks, we're going to camp out on just one verse, four sermons on one verse, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Isaiah 9, 6 is perhaps... Um, the most well-known Christmas verse in all the Bible. It's on a bazillion Christmas cards. And this is what's really cool we're going to be studying for the next four weeks. I believe Isaiah 9, 6 is the single most important prophecy in all the Bible. So we're going to study that. See, Isaiah the prophet, God's prophet in Israel, and through Isaiah, God in his love and his grace has been telling his people Israel time and time again with great patience, God lovingly says, come back to me. Israel stubbornly rejects God over and over again. They make the choice to stay in their sin. And when we come to the book of Isaiah here in chapter 9, time's up. God is going to judge Israel and it is dark, dark days. But 700 years before that first Christmas, God shines a light into that dark scene. There's a prophecy, a prophecy that talks about a coming Savior, a coming Messiah, the prophecy of Christmas. In this Christmas season, maybe you feel like you're in the dark. 
Maybe you're confused about what's going on in your world. Maybe you lack peace. Maybe God's been trying to get your attention and you have been running from the one who loves you more than anyone else. Maybe you're anxious. Maybe you're trying to find meaning in the stress and struggle. Well, Isaiah's prophecy is God's word to you and to me this Christmas. At Christmas, we see heaven's answer. Whatever your battle is, this is heaven's answer. At Christmas, God became a baby. That's amazing. So if you're physically able to stand, I would ask you to stand while we read Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 together. So glad you are here with us. Again, let's read this together. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Lord, how I pray over these coming weeks, those names will help us to see who you really are, who that baby in the manger, what that baby was all about, the true meaning of Christmas wrapped up in those four names. Lord, you are the name above all names, and at your name, every single knee will bow and every tongue will confess, and we worship you because you alone are worthy. We want to learn more about your name to change our lives and to change the lives of those around us. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. This one verse, Isaiah 9, 6, sums up really what Christmas is all about. I'm going to take about three minutes on the first part of the verse. I could do an entire message on it on how this sums up the meaning of Christmas. First of all, at Christmas, we see why Jesus came. It says, for unto us. You're going to see that phrase twice, for unto us. That reminds us that God loves us. God loves each of us. God loves all of us. God loves you. For God so loved the world, Christmas, he gave his only begotten son. Jesus told us why he came at Christmas in Luke 19.10, to seek and to save that which is lost. Christmas, the why of Christmas is unto us. God in his plan, wanting us with him forever and his grace and his goodness and his kindness, he sent Jesus. I pray unto us is personal that you can say unto you because you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. At Christmas, the way that Jesus came, it's all here in this verse. It says a child is born. Jesus came at Christmas 100% man in sinless humanity. A son is given. Jesus came at Christmas 100% God in full deity. God did not create Jesus. He sent Jesus. Jesus is not like God. Jesus is God. This same prophet Isaiah said in chapter 7, verse 14, that you're going to call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. You see, only Jesus as man, a child is born, could he take my place on the cross. And only Jesus as God, a son is given, could he have the power to destroy sin, death, hell, and Satan. And the way he came as the Son of Man, the Son of God, he came in all authority and absolute royalty. It says the government will be upon his shoulders. That baby in the manger, Revelation 19, 16, is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Government speaks of authority, responsibility, and royalty. On his shoulder speaks of power and control. This reminds us that who Jesus is and what Christmas is all about Jesus, our Savior, our Messiah, he is in absolute control of everything. Everything that happens, he either makes it happen or he permits it to happen. He is in total, absolute control. He has all power. And this morning, he is the only one whose shoulder is big enough to carry the cross, the only one whose shoulder is big enough to carry our sins, the only one who is big enough to carry every single load and concern and problem and confusion you have in your life this morning. He's the one that can carry that. And he's the only one that one of these days, his shoulder's big enough to carry us to heaven. See, we see in Isaiah 9, 6, we see what Christmas is all about. We see compassion for unto us. We see a cradle, a child is born. We see the cross, a son is given. We see a crown, the government's on his shoulders, and finally we see the cross, where we see Christ. We see who Christ is. It says his name will be called. Now, some people have five names here. They put a comma between wonderful and counselor, and there's certainly nothing wrong with that. Jesus is wonderful. But if you look at the oldest manuscripts we have, you have four compound words. 
And I am in that camp that there are four names listed here, not five, four compound names. And that's what we're going to do over the next four weeks is look at these four names. Each of these names define and describe Jesus. Each of these names tell us who that baby in the manger really is. Each of these four names teach us the true meaning of Christmas. If you wrapped up the package of everything that Christmas is about and put that name tag on it, you could write in Wonderful Counselor. You could write in Mighty God. You could write in Everlasting Father. And you could write in Prince of Peace. This first message, we're looking at the first name, the title of part one of our series. His name is simply called Wonderful Counselor. What does that mean to you? What does that mean to me? What does that mean in this world we live in? What does it mean this Christmas that Isaiah, 700 years before that first Christmas, said that baby is the wonderful counselor? What does that mean to you and to me? Well, we need to break that down together. First of all, the phrase wonderful counselor, that compound name, in the original language, it basically is saying this. He's a wonder of a counselor. So we need to define what the word wonderful means, and we need to define what the word counselor means to see what Isaiah is saying here to you and to me about Jesus. First of all, the word wonderful. Now, in our culture today, in our world, wonderful means delightful, it means lovely, it means pleasant. Oh, vacation was so wonderful. Thanksgiving dinner was wonderful. We use the word wonderful at Christmas For about 4,000 times this month, there's going to be a movie on called It's a Wonderful Life about Christmas. We sing a song about Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year. So that's what wonderful means in our day and age. So we see the word wonderful, we think, oh, it's saying Jesus is lovely and delightful and pleasant. We've got to understand that the word wonderful in the Bible carries much more weight and has a much deeper meaning than how we use the word today. The word in the Bible, wonderful, means amazing. It means astonishing. It means it is so good you're in awe, and it is beyond your understanding. Outside of Lamentations in chapter 1, which talks about the wonder of Jerusalem being destroyed, every time you find the word wonderful in the Bible, it's only related to God or to the things of God, because God is the one that is astonishing. God is the one that we're in awe about. God is the one that we can't fathom how incredible he really is. For example, thy testimonies are wonderful. Same word, Psalm 119, verse 129. Such knowledge is too wonderful to me. Psalm 139, 6. God has done wonderful things. Isaiah 25, 1. The Lord of hosts is wonderful in his counsel. Isaiah 28, 29. So the word used to describe Jesus, the counselor, is the word wonderful. It means that he is amazing. He is astonishing. We're in awe because he is so good and so great, our brains can't grasp it all. He's so wonderful. Have you ever seen the Grand Canyon before? I remember the first time Donna and I saw the Grand Canyon. We were like walking up this path, walk through some trees, and you talk about stop in your tracks amazement. The first time we saw it, I I couldn't believe what I was looking at. It was so astonishing and so amazing. Well, think about people who see the Grand Canyon every single day of their life, like a tour guide, for example. Some of those tour guides, I am sure they see the Grand Canyon every day. They still think it's beautiful, but there's some, it's probably lost some of that amazement to them. They're not really in awe of it like they used to be, like we were the first time we saw it, but not all tour guides. There are some people who see the Grand Canyon every single day of their life, and they never cease to be amazed by it. They're, they're astonished and filled with wonder concerning it. I read a quote by just one tour guide, and you can tell she's done this for years. She's seen the Grand Canyon for years over and over again. She has not lost the amazement and the wonder of that place. She wrote this. She said, I, along with my group of 13 campers, are set up in a primitive campground which remains open right on the rim with a fantastic view of the valley without having to leave your tent. I can see the tips of the tents we pitched on a ledge below the rim. I can see the outline of the monuments in the sky behind them changing from midnight blue to orange to daylight as the sun rises. I can sense the wonder. I can sense the wonder they are experiencing as I listen to gasp of amazement and endless clicking of their cameras, and I'm so glad we camped here. Sunrise in the Grand Canyon, she's probably seen it a hundred zillion times, and man, she's still blown away by it. Let me ask you something. Have you got used to Jesus? Or is he wonderful? I mean, 
the one who made the Grand Canyon and all the sunrises and sunsets and became a baby in a manger to die on a cross to save us. Most Christians, it's not open rebellion. Some it is. But many Christians, it's just a drift. We just get busy and we've been saved for quite a while and we get used to Jesus. You know, this Christmas, he's wonderful counselor. Day by day, is Jesus wonderful to you? That's a pretty heart-searching question if, if we'll really face it. When you look at Jesus and look at Christmas, are you still amazed? Are you still astonished that he would come as a baby to die on a cross? When you think of Jesus, does it still make your heart race? Does it stir your deepest emotion of your soul to think about Jesus? You see, he's the wonderful counselor. He's wonderful. Let's approach Christmas this year. Let's approach Jesus never with apathy, but always with astonishment in amazement. Like the psalmist in Psalm 145.3 says, great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Like Habakkuk in Habakkuk 3.2 says, I have heard all about you, Lord, and I am filled with awe by your amazing works. Wonderful, but he is counselor. That word counselor means one who guides and advises and making plans and decisions. Once again, when we hear the word counselor, we may think you're stretched out on a couch and someone is asking you why your mom was so mean to you or something. I don't know. You may think of someone who's giving you some guidance to help you navigate life. A counselor, they, they give you some advice just to make life better, better for you. Now, I don't know what you think of when you think of counselor. The first counselor I ever had in my life, her name was Miss Clary, and she was my high school counselor at Hillcrest High School. As my high school counselor, she gave me advice and guided me in making plans and decisions. She laid out a plan of the classes I needed to take to graduate, how you had to have Algebra 1 before you have Geometry or whatever it would be, you know, classes you needed if you were going to go to college, all the different activities, how it mixed with sports. She was the go-to counselor to give us advice to accomplish a goal to make life better. Just like we said about wonderful, when we see the word counselor, that can be what we think about. We can think about what a counselor means to us today. But like the word wonderful, counselor, as it's used here in the Bible, has a very different and a much deeper, deeper meaning. Don't think someone to give you some friendly advice. Don't think just general guidance. Don't think therapist. Think strategist. See, in the Old Testament, a king had a had a group of advisors called counselors. And they would help the king have wisdom to know what to do in the kingdom to make the important decisions. And one of the most important advisors on that group of advisors was the military counselor who would tell the king how to win victory in battles that might be coming up. That is the meaning of this word in verse 6. It's a picture of that. But here's what Isaiah is saying, because he is the amazing, astonishing, can't understand, wonderful counselor, the strategist who has a plan for life, but he doesn't need, Jesus doesn't need a group of advisors. No, Jesus has never went to anyone and said, hey, how do you do that? Jesus has never received counsel from anyone. He's the only wonderful counselor. He has his own plan that is from him, and that plan is perfect, and that plan is backed by all of his supernatural power because he knows everything about you and everything about me and everything there is to know. Jesus himself is that plan, and Jesus as our counselor is wonderful. He is amazing. He is astonishing. He is beyond understanding. There's so much to him, and that counsel is available to you and available to me. So our wonderful counselor Jesus offers us the wisdom and guidance we need for life. Whatever our crisis or confusion, he has counsel. Whatever our difficulty or decision, he has a direction. Whatever our pressure or problems, Jesus has a plan. So that's what's wrapped up in Jesus being wonderful counselor. Okay, let's take a step back. How does that apply to our world? Well, first of all, you live in this world just like I do, okay? It's hard, it's confusing. And we are people who need counsel. We need guidance in our lives about all areas of life. We need instructions in our lives. If you don't believe me that we as humans need instruction and guidance, we need counsel, I've got proof for you. 
Folks, we put directions on shampoo bottles. It says, wet your hair, lather, rinse, and repeat. We're doomed, man. We are hurting. <laughs> we got to have someone tell us how to wash our hair. And you think about how we need guidance and instructions. How did anything on planet Earth ever get fixed before YouTube videos? I mean, those how-to videos, man, I have fixed the agitator dogs in a washing machine. I've replaced a taillight on a Honda CRV, and I've replaced a garbage disposal by looking at those YouTube how-to videos. We need guidance. We need instruction. We need someone to show us how to do it, how it all works. But we all know in life, we need instruction and guidance over things, how to, much more important than how to wash your hair or how to replace a garbage disposal. How about like, how do you love? What does it really mean to love someone and be loved by someone? Does anyone have any instructions for that? What, what about when a man and a woman get married? How's that supposed to work? Does, does anyone have some guidance? And what about if you're a business owner? And what does it mean to do business? What, what about this thing called government? How's it supposed to work? What's it supposed to look like? What about education? We love our kids. Does anyone have some instructions about what it means, long-range term plans, solutions, help about parenting? Man, what about when someone who means the world to you die? How, how do you, who's got some guidance for that? What about your heart? Times it can just be so empty and searching. We need counsel. See, regardless of what someone may believe in God, not believe in God, we, in our humanity, man, we're all on the same team here. Here's the team we're on. We're trying to figure all this out, okay? I, I, I grew up, never even went to church, man, but I, I was figuring, how do you figure this out? What is this thing called life all about? How, all the things we do in life and all the things of life, every human is just trying to figure it out. And we need counsel. But here's the thing. There are a lot of counselors out there. If you don't believe me, look on Facebook because all of them is going to give you counsel you don't even ask for, okay? Because they're all experts on everything. Now, there are some counselors that are really good. I am grateful that God calls and gifts biblical counselors in the church who uses God's word to help people who are struggling in their life. I'm grateful for biblical counselors. But some counselors are not so good. And it's sad because people are just trying to figure out life and they're looking everywhere for guidance and instructions. Here we are in 2023 with all of our technology and AI and all that kind of stuff. Do you know how fast, how quick astrology is growing in the United States? Astrology. A recent YouGov survey over a quarter of American adults, over 27% of American adults, 37% of adults under the age of 30 believe that the way the planets and the stars line up can influence your life. There's even the start of what's called an astrology university. You can go get your diploma from master astrologers. You can get a diploma in astrology. And here's how they, they offer it to you. They say you can... You can um, you can experience greater self-acceptance, personal empowerment, gain insights, find meaning as you connect with cosmic intelligence at Astrology University. You can take classes like Mysteries of the Dark Moon, classes like Understanding Your Destiny Through Lunar Nodes, or astro Astrological Counseling Tools. There is a big word in the Bible that describes that. It's called baloney, okay? <laughs> Matter of fact, it's more than just harmless. Leviticus 19 and Isaiah 47 says astrology is sinful and satanic. But isn't it sad that people are just trying to figure it out and wanting some counsel for life? They're turning to the stars when they could turn to the one who created the stars, who holds them in his hand, who keeps it all running together. The one who at Christmas made a supernatural star to give guidance to a bunch of wise men. We need counsel. We're trying to figure it out. And there are so many counselors out there, so many voices telling us how, what to do. But you know, the number one counselor we turn to, those who don't need Jesus or don't know Jesus, of course, but even people who know and love Jesus, even believers, our first go-to counselor in life is good old self. We, 
we tend to turn to self to fix our own problems. We tend to turn to self to fix our lives. We tend to turn to self to try to figure it all out. Even people who love Jesus and know Jesus, typically, the first spot we'll turn to is ourselves. And we're not very good at fixing our own problems. One of my favorite how we humans aren't good at fixing problems happened some years back on the San Diego Freeway in California. The wonderful California Highway Patrol pulled this car over. The car was driving the speed limit. But what caught the officer's attention was a pair of feet and legs sticking out of the hood of the front of the car going down the highway. So Highway Patrolman pulled these two guys over and said, what are you doing? And the guy says, well, my gas pedal stopped working. So I'm going to drive and my friend is lying under the hood and he's going to control the carburetor by hand. They couldn't believe when they got a ticket for that. Car had to have Arkansas plates, man. That's all I'm going to say. Had to, had to have plates for Mark. Now, I realize that's kind of a silly example of we try to fix our own things. But here's the facts. We get in a fix trying to fix what we cannot fix. Hear me. You cannot fix yourself. But I've got great news. Praise God. No one is broken beyond repair and Jesus can fix anyone. You see, you, you, you can't fix it. Because when you run away from your problems, you take yourself with you everywhere you go. And we, even as believers, when things are okay, or maybe some little things, oh Jesus, but when things really hit us hard, man, there's such a temptation to say, I've got to fix this. Because we need counsel. And there's so many counsels to turn to. The world, culture, ourselves, our education, our emotions, our experience. A lot of counselors out there. And it really matters who the counselor is we turn to. It really matters. You don't believe me? Ask Adam and Eve. She took counsel from the serpent. Adam took counsel from her. And we're all in this big mess because of that today. But 700 years before that first Christmas, this prophet named Isaiah said, guess what? There's a wonderful counselor coming. A counselor who you can turn to and trust in. A counselor who in 1 Corinthians 1.24 says Jesus is the wisdom of God. Who in Job 12.13 says with him are wisdom and strength and he has counsel and understanding. As our counselor, he knows everything about us. He loves us. He longs for us. This is a counselor whose office hours are 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. And when you talk to him... He's never indifferent towards you or distracted towards you. He's listening to everything he says because he loves you and he longs for you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And this counselor has a perfect plan for your life and my life. And then through Jesus, the Holy Spirit inside of us, he gives us the power to fulfill that plan. Sometimes to see an earthly counselor, people pay up to $75 to $150 per session. And I'm not knocking that. There are situations people need help but on this planet there are times you have to pay 75 to 150 bucks a session with a counselor our wonderful counselor paid with his blood on the cross to counsel us we don't pay he paid the amazement of christmas and the truth and the wisdom that's wrapped up in jesus christ The blessing and the absolute necessity of life, of living life by his counsel, by his wisdom, by his guidance. Okay, how do we do that? How do we live in the real world, all areas of life, the counsel of the wonderful counselor? Well, again, don't make it hard. It's like high school, Miss Clary. How did I receive counsel from Miss Clary? I knew her. If I didn't know her, I couldn't go to her for counsel. I mean, I wouldn't even know what she is or what she does. But I knew who Miss Clary was. Number two, I would talk to her. And number two, she would talk to me. Then I did what she said. It really is that way for the counsel of Jesus. Number one, we have to know him as our personal Savior and Lord. Number two, we have to talk to him. It's called prayer. That's why it says in James 1, 5, if you lack wisdom, ask of God And really key, number three, we have to let the counselor counsel us. We have to let the counselor talk to us through the Word of God. That's why it says in Psalm 119.98, Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, 
for they are ever mine. 2 Timothy 3.15, talking about how Timothy, through his entire life, was taught Scripture. It said they are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Now imagine, here I am at Hillcrest High School. I need to graduate. I need certain classes. I want to go to college and all these things. But I never spend any time with Miss Clary. I know she's my counselor. I know she knows what to do, but I never spend any time with her. And I'm walking through the halls, and one of my buddies says, Man, what's wrong with you? Saying, Well, I got to do my senior year. I don't know what classes to take. I don't know um, how to, what to do for college. I says, Well, have you talked to Miss Clary, your counselor, yet? No, I never spend any time with her. There are some Christians who face things in life and they don't know what to say or what to do or where to go because you spend no time with the wonderful counselor. You don't, it'd be like me never going to Miss Clary's office. I can't expect to be guided. A second scenario is this. Let's say I do go to Miss Clary's office because I know her and I know she's got counsel. And I go to Miss Clary's office, my high school counselor, and I talk and I talk and I talk and I talk. Which, you know, it's hard for you to imagine me doing that. But I talk and I talk and I talk and I never let her say a word. I never let, let her say a word to me. And I walk out of the office and they say, would you talk to Miss Clary? Yeah, I talked to her. What are you going to do? I don't know. See, I need to hear from Miss Clary more than she needs to hear from me. You need to hear from God in his word more than God needs to hear from you in prayer. By all means, pray. But sometimes what we do, we face a crisis and a believer says, well, I'm not going to ignore Miss Clary. They'll say this, well, I've been praying about it. But have you let God speak to you about it? See, we by all means pray, but we don't know what to do because we don't crack open that book. For all of our lives as a believer, we never stop maturing. We never stop growing. We're all a work in progress. we got to have a lifestyle of reading and studying and obeying the Bible. We need counsel in this world. There are counselors there. We have the wonderful counselor who loves us, who saved us. And he says, man, listen, just come to me and talk to me. Because when we're in his word, folks, Jesus, our wonderful counselor, gives us counsel through the Bible. And when we're in the Bible, that's how we have a biblical worldview. This is is how it all works. Here's how we can go through life knowing God's plan for our life, his guidance in our life. We then have a biblical worldview. Every human has a worldview. Someone who is an atheist has a worldview. Here's what worldview means. Every human has a lens they see life through. And that lens is developed from the counselors they listen to themselves culture, education, emotion, experience, whatever it is. Every human has a worldview. It's the lens they see the world with. Every human has a worldview. It's the big picture that's behind how people behave and what they believe. But when Jesus is your wonderful counselor, we can have a biblical worldview. It means that we believe the Bible is how God guides us and counsels us. That it's just not man's best word about God's, that the Bible is God's inerrant word to man. That the Bible is our playbook of how to live a life that pleases God and glorifies God. It's the blueprint for life. And when we have a biblical worldview, that changes things. A biblical worldview, we approach every day saying, what is life about? Well, life isn't just about, you know, my happiness and retirement someday. Nothing wrong with those things. Life is about knowing, enjoying, loving, and serving God. That's what my life's about. A biblical worldview, we find answers to the biggest questions of life. Where did we come from? Why are we here? Why is this so broken and how do you fix it? We find those answers in the Bible. A biblical worldview means I see everything in culture. You pick the most controversial thing in culture. To me, I look at it all through the lens of Scripture. How I decide what is right is what is wrong. What determines what I say, what I do, what I think is based on biblical truth and biblical principles. When you go through life under God's guidance as the wonderful counsel with a biblical worldview, I do not have a religious life on Sunday, a family life when I get home, and a secular life when I'm at school or at work. I don't have a religious life, a family life, and a secular life. I've got one life, and it's life in Christ. And Christ is over all those things. That's why Jesus said in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is our worldview, (laughs) Jesus is the lens we see all things. The wonderful counselor gives us the wisdom and the guidance we need for daily living. 
through the word of God. It really matters the counselor that we listen to. A life of emptiness awaits anyone who looks to themselves or to our world to find answers and fulfillment. Even for believers. You know why maybe you're saved, but there's this emptiness this Christmas season? Because you keep looking at yourself or others to give you fulfillment and answers in your life. It'll never happen. I'll make you a promise. Satisfaction, meaning, and purpose await those who turn to Jesus, the wonderful counselor. To walk daily in God's plan for your life. Know Jesus, the wonderful counselor, is your savior. Talk to him in prayer. And commit to always be learning and always living out the word of God. That's an unending process. We do it our entire life. It all starts with knowing the Savior. Because you know, here's the number one wonderful counsel the wonderful counselor has for you and for me. It goes back to the prophecy. It goes back to Christmas. It's the plan of salvation. God's plan of salvation is the most astonishing, amazing, beyond our full grasp. I don't understand all about it, but man, I believe it. You talk about wonderful counselor and his counseling, it's be saved. Think about it that in my sin, so far from God, deserve nothing but hell. But God didn't kill us all off. Instead, he sent his son to die for us. That God loves us and wants us with him forever so much. The wonderful counselor's plan of salvation that Jesus left the heights of heaven. It's, it's hard to fathom. God became a baby. He wrapped himself in humanity in a manger. To die on a cross, the sinless Jesus for my sin and your sins. To descend to the lowest point of humanity, dead in a tomb. But be in awe because he's alive and he arose. And Jesus, the wonderful counselor's counsel to you and to me, the greatest counsel he has is be saved. Jesus opened up the only door that gives us access to forgiveness, access to freedom, access to new life, access to heaven when this life is over. He is the wonderful counselor. So I go back to what we've been saying throughout this entire message. Where are you at? First of all, where are you at with Jesus? Do you know the wonderful counselor? Is Jesus your personal Savior and Lord? The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved in Romans 10, 13. Let me encourage you to admit your sin and turn to Jesus. If you are a believer this morning, same question. Where are you at in your life? Talking to believers. Why are you so anxious? What are you anxious about? Believer, be honest in your heart. Your life is joy and peace rare to you. You don't experience it very much. This Christmas isn't a time to let Jesus, the wonderful counselor, take over your life. Let him take over. Donna is incredible at wrapping Christmas presents. We bought some wrapping paper. This is not wrapping paper we use, but if you do use it, there's nothing wrong with it. But I, it's, I, I got a picture of it to show you what it is. It's baby Jesus in a manger. He's got his hair parted perfect on the side. Little bird smiling, clean straw. The purpose of this is to wrap a Christmas present with Jesus in a manger. Christmas is not about wrapping a Christmas gift with Jesus. It's how some people see Christmas. Christmas is this thing, and you just kind of wrap Jesus around it in a few places, and that's Christmas. No, Christmas is not wrapping Jesus around a Christmas gift. Christmas is Jesus is the gift. Because 2 Corinthians 9.15 says, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The name tag on God's Christmas gift of Jesus, the wonderful counselor, you look real close. God's 
the Christmas package that what Christmas is all about, there's one name and it's Jesus, the wonderful counselor. But then God has a Christmas gift for you and it is Jesus. And I invite you to really look close at that old name tag. And I've got such incredible news for you. You're going to find your name. Just your name. As if you were the only one. He's the wonderful counselor. Would you pray with me?